academia. Some art articles might agree. They would say that the library is the heart of the university. But all other articles might disagree. They would say that the library is not. In fact, the library is not even relevant in today's society. But I and my faculty and staff several years ago embarked on developing a mission, a vision, and a strategic plan to all designed to ensure that the library would not only be relevant, but that the library's faculty, staff, and services would add value to the academic enterprise, this academic enterprise called Savannah State University. The Scholar Residence Program is one that does add value. And we are fortunate to have as our first Scholar in Residence, Dr. Otis Johnson, who will be introduced by Ms. Jasmine Hype, one of our outstanding students in the Social Work Department. We do have some distinguished guests, but I think that I will wait until the end to introduce them.
uh, federal funds under the Morrell Act unless they created an institution for black people uh, in the state of Georgia. So they did it so that the University of Georgia uh, could continue to receive those funds. But for whatever reason, uh, we're here and we're still standing strong and as far as I know now our future uh, looks bright. There are some things I want to get out of the way uh, before I get too carried away because once I get into this it, it's so fascinating uh, that I'm reliving 49 years of uh, you know something that happened 49 years ago. But I first want to thank our library, uh, Miss Pio. I came to see her, I think it was November of 2011. I was winding up my term as mayor. I had the intention of writing a book, and I know how I am, and so I needed a place to work away from home. And I came out here and I asked her if she would let me use a study room to work on my book, some place where I could bring material and set up a little computer and come every day and be about the task of staying on task. Because I'm the kind of person that I love to get involved in things, and if I don't stay focused, I'll be doing 50 other things before I know it. And she said she thought that was a good idea, but I would have to get permission from the interim president, Dr. Dozier, before she could do that. And, you know, the chain of command, and she was doing what the person in her position knows to do. So I wrote the letter to Dr. Dozia asking her to allow me the privilege of using a study room for about a year because I'm on this timetable to get this thing done. Uh, when you're my age and you have a heart condition, you don't know when the end's going to be, so everything is you know, special and you want to get it done. I got a letter back that I didn't expect. I got a letter, a very nice letter, that said that she was proud, uh, that I wanted to come back, and she had spoken uh, to the librarian and they were in full support of the idea, and that I would be welcome on campus. And then they attached uh, the information about how I could get a parking decal, <laughs> how I could get an uh, <laughs> ID, <laughs> all the things that I need to, to know about to be legit. I said that I wanted to start on February 1st. I came out here on February 1st. And rather than having a study room, I have an office in the Rewrite Center that is so far beyond what I had hoped to have, I still can't believe it. I mean, it is totally outfitted down to paper clips. <laughs> and so I just want to thank Ms. Fiola for doing that and for the reception that I have received from all of the staff members in the library. They have been very helpful in helping me prepare for this lecture. I also want to especially thank Ms. Miles Edmondson uh, for helping me get this stuff together, and Mr. Scott, and Ms. Uh, uh, Ogden, and I, I, I'm going to stop because I'm going to miss somebody and they'll be hurt. But everybody has been so Great. The next thing I want to say is that I was asked, do you want to invite any special people? And I said, yes. And I thought about the people 
that had been so instrumental uh, in the history and the development of this great institution. My first thought came to Dr. Clyde Hall, who is here today, uh, because as I was preparing uh, and doing the research, of course I had to refer to his book on the university. And if you haven't seen it, you need to read it. It's entitled 100 Years of Educating at Savannah State College, 1890 to 1990. And this is Dr. Clyde W. Hall, EDD, who is a Regents Professor Emeritus of Engineering Technology at Savannah State. And that's Dr. Hall right there. <laughs> the first title of this lecture which was in the outline of the book that I'm writing, because this is a chapter. And I'm telling people I'm killing two birds with one stone. I'm fulfilling my commitment to give one lecture a semester as an exchange for how great you have been in receiving me back home. But it also now uh, has allowed me to write chapter four in my book. <laughs> so the lecture will be transferred phone uh, into a chapter, and then I have agreed for another lecture in the summer semester. That will be another chapter in the book, and in the fall of the year, there will be another chapter. So I get to write three chapters and share them with the SSU fan. So it works out very, very well for me. Now, the second person I want to introduce is somebody that I have worked with over the years, and I know this person uh, likes history because she was a history major, has a PhD in history, and she also served as an interim president along uh, with Dr. Hall, and that is Dr. Annette K. Brock, and she is here, uh, and she responded to the invitation, and then uh, I have to uh, introduce my special friend, Siobhan Carr, who is proofreading a lot of this stuff and giving me suggestions. And there are a lot of other people that I should recognize, but definitely I have to recognize my brother, Paul Johnson, who was also out here and a participant along with me in what we're going to talk about today. So I think I've done all the, the formalities that I need to do, so now I'll get right on down to the main quotes. I said that I had another title for this before I uh, got into Dr. Hall's book, and that was the Savannah State Student Boycott of 1963. But when I read Dr. Hall's account, he entitled that section of his book, Student Uprising. I said, hey, man, I got to change this. <laughs> so, like a uh, good scholar does, I have given a citation of where I got that title from. Because I don't want Dr. Paul to read my book and sue me <laughs> for plagiarism. <laughs> so, the other person that I invited but I don't see her, was Dr. Margaret C. Robinson. I was in her class when the uprising took place in 1963. I was taking the second biology sequence in the core curriculum from her. And I know you all still have that core curriculum, and I applaud it because I believe in biblical arts education. And you need to know some science, some math, some literature, all that stuff is very important in making you well-rounded and prepared for the vicissitudes of life because they're going to be there and the more diverse you are, the better you are prepared to survive. And that's a part of my story, uh, which you can read when you try to book. <laughs> yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Definitely. There are two chairs. Yeah. 
You heard in the introduction that I uh, am a 1960 graduate of Beach High School in Savannah. In 1960, there were two high schools that blacks could attend. The Alfred E. Beach High School and the Tompkins High School, which was renamed after the Woodville High School burned down. They named it after Sophonia Tompkins, who had been a fellow uh, principal at the Woodville School. Now they have renamed that school again, the Woodville Tompkins Technical Career Center. But there were only two. This was after the 54 decision. This community was very, very slow like all communities in Georgia, in embracing the 54th Supreme Court decision. Now, I went into the Navy on active duty, thinking that I was going to spend 20 years, because I've always been a person, if you ask me what they're going to do, I got my plan. So as I left high school, I was going to spend 20 years in the Navy. But as, as it were, I joined the Navy Reserve, so I didn't have to put four years in active duty. I could put two years in active duty and do the other four in the active reserve. Some of you may be uh, midshipmen here. I don't know. But anyway, immediately after graduating in June, <coughs> I went on a ship and went around all of Europe and through the Middle East and all around. And I decided that, hey, this military thing ain't going to cut it for me. <laughs> because, you know, when, I have, when I'm told to do something that I don't think it makes sense, I'm going to ask why. <laughs> and in the military, you don't ask why. You just go on and do it. And I couldn't see 20 years of my life doing that, even if I had become a non-commissioned officer. You still always have somebody in the top telling you what to do. So I had been smart, and uh, I was one of those people that they call the bookworm and all like that. And uh, I'm so glad I was. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I said I've got to find something else to do with the rest of my life. At the end of those two years, I was going to be 20 years old. I had my whole life. In so I said, well, I've got the grades, I need to go take the SAT. I didn't even take the SAT in high school because I knew I was going to spend 20 years in Navy. I didn't need to take the SAT. So I was stationed in Newport, Rhode Island, and I took the SAT at one of the, it was an interesting experience, one of the private, posh little boys who lived up there in Newport, if you know about Newport, you know, that's where a lot of rich folk have big old houses and then they got this special place for their boys. So I went on over there and took the SAT, sent the scores to Savannah State with my admission material, and I was admitted. So here I come in the fall of 1962, trying to set the context, okay? Y'all follow me? Thank you. I, I'm a Baptist, so every once in a while I'm going to ask you, you know, like the preacher, you know, you know, uh, you with me? Can I get an amen? Yeah. All right. So, in the fall of 1962, I enrolled as a freshman. Now, my class from Beach had already been here two years. So, 
you know, I make reconnecting, making all these reconnections, with making friends with with uh, with new people. So what am I going to major? Well, I played in the high school band, and in those days, Beach had a monster band. We tried to emulate the Florida A&M band, and everybody was doing the steps and twirling the horns and all that stuff. So I said, well, you know, that could be fun to become a band director. So when I had to fill out a major selection, you know what I filled out, because they had education here then. So I enrolled as a music education major with the intent of becoming a band director. <laughs> well, I didn't become a career naval person. And you know I didn't become a band director. But that's what I did. Came, got my uniform in the fall, marched in the marching band, started playing in the concert band, and then in the spring of 1963, my freshman year, is when the uprising occurred. Now my brother sitting over there is one year behind me. So he was a sophomore and I was a freshman. So in the spring, we heard these rumors, and uh, there's something about spring on college campuses. <laughs> it's just something about it. You know, it, 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 it's just a spring ritual for students to raise hell on college campuses. <laughs> just go back through the history of academia in the United States, and you will find campus uprising in the spring. Now why they don't do it in the fall, I guess everybody's so happy to be back, they're not going to cause any trouble. <laughs> and then it's cold in the winter, <laughs> so you know, you ain't going to be out there, you know, you're going to try to be, so the spring comes. Always trouble on college campus. So we hear these rumors. And so we want to know well, what, what's going on here? Because, you know, I'm a freshman. You, you know how freshmen are always the last to learn things. What's going on is the seniors and the juniors are running things. So we begin to hear that this college professor had been fired and that he shouldn't have been fired. That was the word that was going around. Now, there were some people involved in this that I want to show you. That's a photograph of the historic marker indicating uh, that we were uh, the first and why we were the first and all that good information. If you haven't read it, you need to read it. That's my freshman picture. <laughs> In the 1963 year, that's me. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> what a change. But anyway, this authenticate that I was hit. <laughs> doubts about it. There I am. This is the professor. source of the unrest. This is Cleveland A. Christoph, who was at that time the head of the Department of Economics. He was a very popular professor. He arrived on campus in 1961. <coughs> now, we've got faculty members here and we all know that in the university system of Georgia, you have a probationary period, a two-year probationary period. And you 
have to complete this probationary period, quote, satisfactorily. In other words, you have to be judged worthy of staying on this campus. If you don't get that satisfactory rating, then you are not offered a contract and you're gone. So Dr. Christoph came on this campus in the fall of 1961 as the head of the Department of Economics. Now I'm saying that Christoph made three strikes which then led to his ulcer from this place. Number one, it is alleged that he wanted to recruit a white student from the Hunter Army, not the Hunter Army, it wasn't the Army then, it was Air Force, the Hunter Air Force Base to take a class from him. That's one strike, because Savannah State wasn't desegregated yet. People knew about that on this campus. Strike number two. It is alleged, and I'm saying alleged because only Dr. Clyde Hall and Mark Robinson were actually connected enough to, to know and, and, and perhaps during the exchange period, they'll get an opportunity. Well, Dr. Roxton didn't hear, but I'm sure anxious to hear what Dr. Paul says about the veracity of what I'm saying. Because I know he's like me, he will tell you the truth. And if you don't tell the truth, he'll tell you you didn't tell the truth. <laughs> and that'll only help me make my book more credible. So again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taking every opportunity that I can. But anyway, the second strike was, and this was alleged by one of the, quote, ringleaders, that Dr. Christoph was working with the debating society to invite the Harvard debating team to visit Savannah. That didn't go over very well. And the third strike was he had the audacity in 1963 to apply to become the superintendent of public education in Chatham County. The schools hadn't been desegregated yet, and this man is going to apply <laughs> to become the superintendent. Now, I know you know he's not white. <laughs> I know you know that. All right, so he is the principal in getting this uprising going because he was given a letter informing him that he would not be offered a contract for the next academic year. Students didn't like that very well. This is the president, William Kenneth. He was the fifth president of this institution, and according to Dr. Hall, the longest serving president of this institution. And we've had a string of very short serving presidents, because if you don't get along with the Board of Regents, you ain't going to be here very long. So this is the other key figure <coughs> in the student uprising. Now, uh, let's look at the student leaders. This is a picture of Mary <coughs> Moss, who was a junior at the time. And I want to say a little bit about these students because they weren't just run-of-the-mill students. These were exceptional students involved in all kinds of things that students should be involved in. They weren't what you consider your normal rabble route. 
Mary Moss was a part of the group that was called the Campus Action Committee. The Student Action Committee, I'm sorry. Student Action Committee, SAC. Mary Moss graduated in 1964, went on to Howard University Law School, became a lawyer, came back to Albany, Georgia, and practiced law, and became a member of the Georgia State Legislature. So she is a somebody, and was a somebody then on this campus. She died a few years ago. Here, she is being inducted into Alpha Kappa Mu. I hope you all know what that is. It's an honor society. So not only uh, was she involved, but she was smart. Here she is speaking during the National Education Assembly Program. Now, I hope you all are looking at the way these folk were dressed. Because that's the way we used to dress when we came to school, with the exception of the hats. If you had a special program or something, then you put the hat on. But almost every day, so you just like Dr. Brock, who's an alum, that's up. Now, I don't know what to say. So <laughs> 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 that's a, my classmate. I couldn't find a picture of Carolyn Quillen. She was Quillen at the time. She's Coleman now. But Carolyn Quillen on, I will never forget it, March the 16th, 1960, when we were seniors at Beach, along with another classmate of mine, Joan Tyson, went down to a segregated lunch counter called the Azalea Room in what was the Levy's department store in downtown Savannah. It is now the SCAD library. So if you know where the SCAD library is, you know where that department store was, and you entered the restaurant on the Broaden Street side. Carolyn Fuller, Joan Tyson, and a couple more students went down there on March the 16th. I can remember that because it's the day before St. Patrick's Day, and everybody in Savannah knows March the 17th is St. Patrick's Day. So it makes it very easy to remember that day. She went down there and was arrested. She and her colleagues. They were members of the NAACP Youth Council. So here we are at Beach in 1960. Carolyn and Joan our classmates are going before the judge at the court of court. So we are going to support them. So in a naive move, we went to school that day and then left school to go to the hearing. Now, if we had been smart, we would just cut school, but we wasn't that smart. <laughs> so the principal, Arthur Douglas, whether he did it on his own or whether he got that phone call from the superintendent or somebody at the Board of Education, put us all out of school. Everybody who had left because we had been to school, got on the road, left, and then after the thing came back. <laughs> but, I mean, you know, we were caught up in the movement. We were thinking about things like that. And so the only time I was ever suspended from school was on that occasion, and I certainly am not ashamed of that. The bad part about it is I had to go home and tell my granddaddy that I had been suspended from school. And school was no play thing in those days. So he had to come with me to go back to school to ask Mr. Douglas to readmit me. And of course, Mr. Douglas, you know, made us 
you, you know you know how they do it. They make you say you're sorry and you won't ever do it again. And so, you know, I was a senior. I just said anything to get back in school. I was about to mess up my career in the Navy. You were going to go into the Navy. So I go on and graduate. But Carolyn came to Savannah State, and I had to go back to my yearbook to get this because I could not find a picture of Carolyn Wood in any of the yearbooks. So I guess she didn't want to take pictures of me, what else? <laughs> but I found her. I called her yesterday. She's now living in North Carolina. I called her and had an interview. So I have her uh, ideas and thoughts about what was going on because she was in the midst of it. Carolyn graduated and went with our current mayor, in Jackson, to Alabama as field organizers for the NAACP. Edna Jackson didn't finish at that time, but, you know, we were all caught up in the movement. Some things just had to be placed on hold, like the Freedom Riders, you know, and other people put things on hold. This is more important. So she and Carolyn go into Alabama and work for the NAACP. After a year, Edna comes back and finishes up and then starts a career out here that leads to where she is today as the first African American woman mayor of the city of Savannah. These people weren't white. Right. They were serious. Carolyn went on to become a regional director for the NAACP in Memphis, and then came back to North Carolina, where she was elected a county commissioner after working in the governor's office in North Carolina. And so Carolyn is one of those people that were central to pulling together and holding together the Student Action Committee. This is James Brown. James Brown, Jr. James Brown, Jr. was at the tip of the spell, so to speak. He was very involved in a number of things. Now, don't ask me what that club is for. I, I know. But somebody will tell me, Dr. Doctor, Doctor Hall, do you know? Do you know what this Thirsty Dideen club is? We, we'll, we'll reel right down. But it's not, that, it, I'm just trying to show the level of involvement of these students. You could write a book about this man. <laughs> Oh, let me, let me go back. Brown graduated in 1964. He went into the real estate business for a while and eventually became the director of the NAACP Youth and College Division. He's dead. But he spent the bulk of his career working for the NAACP, and all of these folks were members of the college chapter of the NAACP at the time. Hill graduated in June of 1963, went on to Howard Law School, earned his degree, came back to Savannah, started practicing law with Judge E.H. Gaston for a while and eventually went out on his own. Bobby Hill became the first elected official from Chatham County since Reconstruction when he was elected to the Georgia House of Representatives. I think it was 67 or 68, but by the time I write all of this up, I'll have the correct dates. 
but I know y'all see where I'm going. Hill was one of the most brilliant lawyers that ever graced this earth. And he, if his life had gone in a better direction, he could have been a viable candidate for at least lieutenant governor of the state of Georgia. He was that well respected in the state legislature. Here, he was a member of the business club. He was on the right hall dormitory council because he was from Athens, Georgia. Quillen and Brown were from Savannah, and Moss was from Fitzgerald. He was on the, the Bathing Society. And I found this picture in the 1962 yearbook, and you couldn't have found a better picture, because these two guys were like that. And they got blamed for all the trouble. <laughs> Once you stand up and you are identified, then be prepared to pay the time. But that was such a powerful picture. I wanted to share that with you. So now, they didn't do all of this without some faculty help. And the major advisor to the college chapter of the NAACP was the library. Lonnie J. Joseph. Most folk just said E.J. Joseph. When you look at the communiques that these young people were writing, countering the statements and stuff given by the college director of public relations, I know these folks were smart, but you have to say somebody was proofing that stuff to make sure that uh, it was tight. And so a lot of us who were involved believed that Josie was one of the hands behind making sure that these statements were tight. If you're interested, in reading this blow by blow, Josie did clippings of news articles, and they're all in the archives. That's how I got this information. And I read it, and I studied it, and now I can do it almost with, with, without notes. Because when you live it, and then 49 years later you revisit it, you know, it doesn't take a whole lot. You know, to, to, to get it right. But this was Joseph. And I'm trying to get the characters in together. This building was the administration building. It no longer exists. It had the auditorium in that building where we had weekly assembly programs. And we had to go to assembly programs and we had to get a slip and sign our names on it to authenticate the fact that we had been there. And there were penalties involved for missing a symbol because you were expected to be there. It's just like what happened, and I don't know whether they still do it or not, the, 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 the legend is that this used to happen at Mohawks. Every week, they'd have, and, and they would have speakers and programs and performances that were all designed to further enrich you and to help you be a better human being and also a more purpose-driven person. But this is where the president was, the <coughs> dean of faculty, and uh, other administrators of the registrar's office was in there. This is Hill Hall. Now, Hill Hall is beautiful as a result of the restoration. But this is Hill Hall, an old picture with students, I guess, in front. But that's the way Hill Hall looked back in 1963, or as I remember it. So it, and this was built by students. And Dr. Hall can give you a story about how many of these older buildings were built by students in fact.
but these play a key role in the story as it unfolds. Now, let's say what happened. In April, Christoph gets his left. In the middle of April, students become aware of the dismissal, and they circulate a petition demanding Professor Christoph's reinstatement. Now, there's a disagreement over when was this petition delivered to the president. The students hold a press conference on April the 17th, 1963, saying that they had delivered the petition demanding the reinstatement of Professor Christoph. The administration says they haven't gotten it. They don't know anything about it. The president asserts that it was at least the 20th some people say the 22nd of April before he gets it. But these students now holding a press conference saying that they have delivered this petition. And people really don't like it. The president feels that he's blindsided. You have faculty members who want to put these upstarts in their place. You got to think about the student-faculty-administration relationship in the 60s now. It, it's not like y'all. I mean, this laissez-faire stuff y'all got. I mean, no, it wasn't like that. The students were staying their place. And they were getting out of their place by going to the press, demanding that the president reinstate a faculty that's really overstepping the bounds that had the boundaries around what students were supposed to be involved in. You came here to get an education, you stay out of these other things, you stay focused, you get your degree, and you go on about your career. These folk were stepping across the bounds. So, again, referencing uh, Dr. Hall's book, who was probably in those meetings, I see him shaking his head. <laughs> they said, the administrative council said, we want to expel these two students who stood up there before the press and denounced the president. And again, referring to Dr. Hallbrook, there was a small number of faculty members who felt that that was going too far. But the majority carried the day. So Hill and Brown were expelled. I was one of those who said, oh, no, 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 this is an injustice. First of all, you fired this man, uh, and now you're going to put students out for taking advantage of the First Amendment. Uh, no. And I guess a lot of other students felt that way. So Hill and Brown Smart as they are, were, because both of them were able, decided that we were going to have a boycott of classes to put pressure on the president to, first of all, give Christoph a contract and to reinstate Bill and Brown. So the Student Action Committee was formed, and then on the 29th, the boycott of classes began. About 17, about, there, there were 11, according to the records, 1,146 or 47 students on the whole to the bottom. About 700 of us gathered at what was called the bandstand. The configuration of the circle is much different than it was in 1960. There was a gazebo that we called the bandstand. And it was at the front of the college campus. And on the 29th, we all, Monday morning, when we were supposed to go to class, go, well, 700 of those 1147 didn't go. And 
Hill was a very fiery speaker, and James Brown was no slouch himself. <coughs> and we had a good time. As a matter of fact, the president was hung in effigy that day. But we had a good time. I mean, you, you can't imagine testosterone that was told <laughs> and the estrogen and all of that stuff. So, I mean, we were fired up because, first of all, this is 1963. This is in the midst of the civil rights the, the demonstrations. They were demonstrating in Savannah. Students on this campus were very involved in those demonstrations. Some of us believe that some of the motivation to get rid of Brown and Hill was because of their leadership in the NAACP college came, uh, uh, chapter that was getting students to go. Plus you had Jose Williams and the Crusade for Voters doing their own thing, which was more radical than what the NAACP was doing. And that's a lecture that I am dying to make, to talk about Jose Williams and W.W. W. Law and their leadership in the civil rights struggle in Savannah. But anyway, let me press on, because it's getting long and some of you may be getting bored. But anyway, on the 29th, you see the, 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 uh, the caption, Students Carry Evidence of Pain and Demonstrate. Man, if you, if, can you feel the energy there? Oh man, we were really high. <laughs> Now, in those days, demonstrations at the local level, according to the white power structure, could not occur without outside agitators. Because the local people just wouldn't have sense or nerve enough to do this kind of crazy stuff. So, you started getting charges about outside agitators. Now let me just read from the Savannah Evening Press on that day, May the 29th. President of SSC hung in effigy. Ulterior motives, says Payne. Now let me just tell you some of the signs that we have. Communism is dead. <laughs> is this Russian? <laughs> no more Uncle Tom education. Kremlin State College. Now you know we weren't smart enough to come up with that on our own. It had to be an outside agitator. <laughs> because at the local level, you just don't come up with stuff like that. You, you know our folk to, in, you know, <laughs> in control. And what led to fueling that even more was the fact that Willie Lunn, who was the field representative for the NAACP lo located in the regional office in Atlanta, came to Savannah. That's all they needed to substantiate their outside agitation. Let me read you a quote. Students, this is, this is the outside agitator. NAACP leader on state campus. This is part of the newspaper. So, so the agitator has arrived. We just not smart enough to do this on our own. Uh, let me, let me go to that. This is Wilton C. Scott. He crafted uh, the releases, and he talked basically to the press. President Payne didn't do a lot of talking uh, to the media, but Scott did. Let me read something that Scott said. This, this is a quote. The students have been brainwashed badly by some outside source, Scott Charles. If this is allowed to succeed, at Savannah State, the same thing could happen to any Negro school in Georgia, he said. 
continued on his quotation. He contended that the alleged outside sources have been using the technique of the big lie in what he said was the style of Hitler and Khrushchev. <laughs> so you know how I feel about that. Right? <laughs> anyway, I, I've got more quotes, but time doesn't allow me to do that. But I, I want to set, set up this thing. Now, the interesting thing about it is to see the attitude of the people in Atlanta. L.R. Cyber. Executive Secretary to the Regents said in an article entitled Mass Pullout to Close SSC for the Regents says, and I quote, we're not going to have anyone arrested. If they want to demonstrate, we're not going to say anything about it as long as they don't destroy state property. That's what the Regents said. They were taken in the beginning of rather hands-off approach, expecting the president to deal with this, but that's what the president's supposed to do. Keep order on your campus. Now, London said that as long as, oh, and they say this about London, as long as he doesn't destroy property, he can go on the campus, just as you or I could decide to totally report. But then, when they couldn't break the movement, in a couple of days, they changed their tactic and issued an order barring all persons who were not students, faculty, or staff from entering the campus. Asked the Chatham County Police Department to seal off the campus and to arrest anybody who was trans, uh, 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 um, what's the word, um, trespassing, trespassing on state property. So here is the chief of police for the Chatham County Police Department talking to the students. And he took, I thought, a very good position. He asked the students to go back the class. And our response was, no, we're not going back until our demands are met. And he said that as long as we were orderly, that he would make no arrests. Now, I have no record of any arrests being made. It was a peaceful protest. Very spirited, but peaceful. So this goes on from April, April 29th until March the 6th, just having these daily demonstrations. So the demonstrations aren't getting anywhere. So now the new tactic is we're going to withdraw from school. We'll close this place down. <laughs> so at the end of one of those little fiery reckless meetings out there in front of the bandstand, he said, we're going to withdraw. So we march over then to back to no. look, we go to where Dean Nelson Freeman is in this in this building. Nelson Freeman was the chairman of student personnel. We going to be a student. Four hundred students pick up applications to withdraw. In addition to that, sixty-five of us go over to Armstrong to pick up applications to transfer, and <coughs> students who withdraw are encouraged to apply to the University of Georgia for admission. Those things changed the attitude of the region. But they were happy. As a matter of fact, they had just admitted the first two students in 1961. 
So then they clamp down and the rhetoric changes. They then say that if you aren't back in the classroom by Thursday, this was Tuesday, if you aren't back by Thursday, you're all going to be put out and you're not going to be able to get into any other state school in Georgia. Not only that, any senior trying to withdraw and go to Georgia would have to spend at least another year because of the residency requirement. The university system of Georgia has a residency requirement. In order to get a degree from an institution, you have to spend one year in residence at that institution. So then that begins to make a lot of us say, oh no. <laughs> Do we really want you know, to, to continue with this? And I can imagine those phone calls from home. Oh. Yeah. yeah. What are y'all doing down there? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to mess your life up if you don't get back in that class and get your degree. You know how parents are. Yeah. They love us, they want to protect us, and they want the best for us. But in that day and time, a lot of them just didn't understand where we were. And a lot of that stuff just didn't wash. So, 400 people went over there to Nelson Friedman's office. And there were reasons you had to have three signatures. You had to have the signature of the dean. You had to have the signature of the uh, dean of faculty. And then you had to have the signature of the college register. These three signatures. So they were very busy over there that day. Some of the reasons given for the drawing were for the best interest of the school, lack of academic freedom, and they don't agree with college policy. I was one of those who was encouraged to go over to Armstrong and pick up an application because I was a freshman. Armstrong was a two-year college at the time, located downtown on Bull Street. Sixty-five of us, all full of it, went over and picked up those applications. I was the only one to turn my head. <laughs> when they got home and they thought about it, they decided they weren't going. But I learned another lesson about commitment. If you commit to a cause, go with a thousand, or go by yourself. So they put me through all kinds of stuff. They made me take the whole freshman battery of tests again, whole admission battery again. Took those tests. Had the transfer, uh, uh, the transcripts in. Went over there for interviews. Everything that they could think of, I went through. And then they finally let me in. And I was glad, I'm glad now that I did it. Because I didn't make a Navy career. I, 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 I wasn't so interested now in being a band director because I was caught up in the movement. And so I went over there and I ended up uh, getting a two year degree in liberal arts, went on to the University of Georgia majored in history, came back home, got involved in the, uh, first the anti-poverty program, and then the Model Cities program, and on and on and on, I won't bore you with that. But that was a game changer for me. So now things are really spiring out of control, and a compromise has to be made. So what happened? President calls Hill and Brown in, and they have about a two-hour meeting, and they come out of the meeting saying that Hill and Brown have issued a statement uh, saying that you know they're going to behave and they're going to encourage the students to go back to class, and so after ten days, the strike ends, uh, and what did we get out of all? 
The interesting thing about it is that when the Regents members came and met with the faculty and with the students, a lot of things came to life. And the chairman of the Regents and the chancellor were on, not the chairman, but the local region, Anton Sommers, the speaker at the graduation. <coughs> and the chairman of the regions came down and promised this institution a million dollars in improvements. Now, you have to ask, did those young people know that in the end, their disruption and all the hell that they were accused of raising would do so much to improve this institution. There's no way that they could have figured that. But out of that protest, Christoph was not rehired. He had a hearing, and uh, the hearing uh, went against it. Don't know where he ended up. Doctor, do you know where he went? Nobody knows where he went, but somebody will, will tell us soon. But he left, and things went on. Like I said, Hill graduated that June, went on to his career. All the rest of the folk involved went on to stellar careers. So what were some simple results of the uprising? Students brought to light grievances that resulted in a million dollar improvement program. These are the members of the committee that came down <coughs> to talk to faculty and students. So the students brought to light a lot of grievances that had just not been dealt with before. Whether they were real or imagined or whatever, uh, it doesn't matter. Second thing, the boycott and the tactics of withdrawing from the college and transferring to the University of Georgia and the Armstrong College led to the desegregation of Armstrong State College. There is no doubt about that. I'm not a band director, but I sure love you. <laughs> I'm so happy I went over there because it took my career on a different path. And finally, it is believed that many, me included, that the enormous pressure that was placed on President Payne during the uprising led to his premature death in July of 1963. He had a cerebral hemorrhage and many of us believe that all of that pressure that he was under, trying to keep the regents happy, but hopefully in his heart knowing that those students were right and put tremendous pressure on him. And for African Americans and others who get into that kind of situation, people do not understand the kind of pressure that you were under to try to keep the masters happy so that you can have a job and keep trying to do good in your job and then knowing what is right and not being able to do what is right in order to survive to do what little good you can in the place where you are. That's woo. Oh, that mercy. I've been there. <laughs> I've been there. I had a heart attack. It just wasn't my time to go. But I understand what he must have gone through. And so, folks, you are at a place that you don't even know a, a tenth of the contribution that this place has made. You got that slogan now, you can get anywhere from here? That's not bull. That's true. If you take advantage of what is here, and you have the commitment and the perseverance to struggle, 
you can make it. And so I wanted to lift this period up to you today as my inaugural lecture. And I hope that something that you have heard has enlightened you and inspired you and made you be reached assured that you are at the right place at the right time with the right opportunities to do anything that you want to do. I'm grateful uh, to this place for that uprising. Were it not for that uprising, I don't know if I'd ever been the mayor of the city of Savannah. You just don't know. So thank you for this opportunity.